being. Um, you might not want to say anything that you don't want to be in the recording on the internet. So thank you very much. We have the chat box. We are going to be doing our speakers queue and also monitoring the chat for comments and questions. I believe responding to some in the chat, others perhaps being read out uh, if they are thematically common. And, and that will be at the discretion of the policy staff. There are slides. You can get hold of those slides and there's a link there. Um, if you're listening, please press star six to unmute when you're called on for the queue and you can press star six to mute again. Otherwise, if you're not speaking, if you can keep your phone muted, we'll also be monitoring that in case there's any background noise. And there is a link there for online resources. So feel free to look at that. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay. Next, uh, next slide. I think this is where I end and Candace begins. Thank you, Candace. Thanks so much, John, and thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Candace Bailey, and I am the HCBS Division Director. And thank you for coming to our off-schedule added meeting to go through some additional things within the PDN regulations. Um, so I'm going to start us out with going through the purpose of this meeting, and we'll go through some slides that we've gone through in every meeting, and then we can get going. So. The purpose of these meetings is really to gather input from you all. We really want to hear um, what you think about some of these changes, what other things need to be changed. Um, and this is all in relation to the private duty nursing benefit. And so these are uh, an overview of the regulations and proposed changes. So next slide, please. Uh, so here's our uh, agenda. We'll do some uh, quick HICPUF introductions. Uh, Cassandra put in the attendance form in the chat. We'll put it in again because I know folks are still um, jumping in. So we'll continue to put in some of those things. If you could complete the attendance form so that we know who's joining us today, that would be very helpful. We'll go through our meeting guidelines um, and then we'll have our full on presentation with discussion and the next steps. So first and foremost, uh, we'll do a quick uh, introduction of HICPUF staff so you know who all is joining you today. Um, obviously, I'm Candace Bailey and the division director where these benefits um, sit is from a policy standpoint. Um, with me, I also have Cassandra Keller, uh, the section manager, Aaron Thatcher, the unit supervisor, Christine Merriman, the benefit manager. Um, so lots of us on. Um, we have a, a number of folks from our clinical team. I believe I saw Valerie Carter and I think Michelle Miller might be on, who's our chief nursing officer within the department. So we have a lot of uh, clinical expertise uh, here as well to answer any of those clinical questions. And then, of course, John Berry, who is our facilitator extraordinaire. Um, I think every single one of you probably knows him very well by now because he does such a remarkable job of facilitating. We ask him to do many, many meetings. All right. Next slide, please. OK, so housekeeping, a couple of things. John hit on some of these. Please make sure you're muted when you're not speaking because when you're not, if there's background noise, it's really hard for folks to hear. Um, and so we'll just wanna make sure that we're muting when we're not speaking. Uh, raising your hand and unmute yourself um, when it comes time for questions and comments, that'd be great. Use the chat box to enter questions and comments. We will go through those as best we can live. For those that we cannot get to live, we will actually post those online with responses. Um, we do capture every single comment that comes in through the chat box. Please, please, please do not disclose any PHI, protected health information. Uh, we cannot discuss cases, so we can't be specific. If any um, public health information or protected health information, and I always say public, um, were to be disclosed, we then could not post our recording, which would be uh, really sad as not everybody is able to make every meeting. And it's really important for folks to be able to hear the meetings and have an opportunity to go back and listen. Or even if you did uh, participate and join and you wanna hear a few things again, um, it's really important for us to be able to post the recording of these meetings. Uh, the team is gonna do their absolute best to answer all questions. That includes myself to answer all questions when they come in. We cannot necessarily always get to everything. So again, we will capture everything and um, post it. Everything is posted. Um, if you have additional questions outside of today, we have our email inbox right there, the homehealth.state.co.us. You are welcome to send those questions, comments, suggestions to that inbox at any time. 
And then of course, um, there's the link for where everything will be posted after this meeting. Next slide, please. So here's our process. Um, again, these are slides that you've seen multiple times if you've been to multiple of these meetings. Really spending the entirety of the year 2023 going through these regulations piece by piece so that we can break them down and make sure that we can make the revisions that are necessary. Our goal is to present these uh, in the spring or present these at the end of 2023, beginning of 2024 mouthful to say all at once in case anybody's wondering, um, to the Medical Services Board and have them effective in the spring of 2024. Um, we are not to the point yet where we have a date for when we are planning to present because we're not through our process. So just to be clear, um, I will say this probably multiple times throughout today's meeting, we are not to the point of where we have a date that we are presenting into Medical Services Board as we have not concluded our stakeholder engagement process. We have, we have another meeting on the books where we will go through the rules in their entirety. And from that point, then we will determine whether or not we are ready to move forward with the Medical Services Board or not. So none of that has been decided yet. Next slide, please. So here are our goals, um, the overarching goals for this entire process. We really want to conduct a thorough review and update the regulations as needed. Um, there are some areas where a lot more updates are needed than others. Um, we're working with stakeholders to revise language that is outdated, make sure that things are much more clear. We wanna identify areas that needs edit, rephrasing, clarification, removing, um, or just restructuring in general. Sometimes as we're making some changes, certain uh, sections no longer fit where they are. So we just kind of move them down or move them up so that it is much easier, has better flow as you're going through the regulations on their entirety. All right. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the overall uh, kind of review of the order of the regulations. So as you can see, there's a link on there um, for the regulations themselves. It starts with definitions, benefits, limitations, eligibility, application procedures, yada, yada, yada. We have actually gone through each of these sections already. Today, we're focusing on definitions. I will say um, I understand that going through definitions without context could be really difficult. And so um, we are going to make sure that we post the link for the regulations, um, for the draft regulations, and we will have a site for each definition so that you can kind of compare, this is where this is found, this is why this term is relevant, doesn't work and as we're going through it. And so those are kind of some of the things that is gonna be a little bit, um, more difficult than some of the others because context matters with definitions, but it was too big of a, thank you, Cassie, for posting that. Um, it was too big of a section to try to lump it in with anything else. And so we're having an entire meeting just to go through our definitions because that is important, as you all know. Next slide, please. So this is um, an overview of, uh, Sorry, I'm getting pinged on like multiple different fronts. Um, so this is an overview of kind of the meetings that we've had, the dates that we've had them and what we went through. So just kind of a refresher of all the months that we've met and where we focused our time and attention. Next slide, please. As we are going through this, um, some general considerations, we ask that you please remember that language and concepts that we are discussing, so proposed definitions are not final. Uh, these are all just proposals. It's just, uh, hey, what do you think about this? Does this work? Does this not work? Those types of things. We are documenting all feedback and ideas. Um, certain words are going to be changed throughout the document. So, for example, any reference to client it will be updated to member. Um, in some cases, again, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, we're just proposing reorganizing sections. That's less so with the definition section. Um, and then, uh, again, please, please, please share your feedback. Um, your suggestions. We really, really appreciate all of your participation. Next slide. There's a lot of uh, preamble here for you guys to kind of get us all in the right mindset. Um, okay, so here is just so you all know, because we've talked about some of the meetings that we've had already, um, I wanted to bring back to the forefront of some things that we are still working on. So some additional research we're doing with other states, conversations, things like that, that are going to have to come back to this group to discuss further. So here are some, uh, some of those listed out, um, PDN specific timelines, um, 
you know, how do we want to handle the transferring apart between agencies, clarification of timeline of appeals, these types of things, par expiration dates. So these are all items that we are still conducting some research on. Um, some of it requires research on the federal regulation side of things. Some of it state statutes. Um, some of it is, you know, billing statutes, that kind of stuff. And so we are still working on those things and we'll have a lot more information at our next meeting. All right. Whew, that was a lot. Um, so we are going to jump in to today's meeting. This is the final section that we have not gone through together as a group. And so we are going to go through the definitions today, proposed definitions, I should say, uh, so that we can make sure that what we have makes sense throughout. We Again, we will have citations for where these definitions or where these words will be found within the regulations. Cassie posted that link, so you all can pull that up if that's helpful for you. Um, and then once we get to the end, we'll talk about our next steps for today's meeting. So as a reminder, uh, the, there's different formats to show kind of what we did. Underline means it's new language, so it was added. Highlighted means it was just renumbered or reorganized. And then le red lettering um, with a strike through means it is, we are suggesting to remove it. All right. John, I am going to get started if that is okay with you. Sure thing. Great. Just a thing. reminder, folks, we are recording now. So thank you for being mindful of that. Thank you, John. And just so you all know, um, Cassie has been posting a lot of links in the chat box. So please take a look at that. Um, we have our attendance form. Please fill that out, our feedback form, and then a link to the current draft rules. Okay, so here's a big one. This is one that we needed to define, continuous nursing. So here is the proposed definition for continuous nursing. Um, it means the required services are medically complex enough to require ongoing assessment, planning, intervention, all of that. You all can read it. Um, this includes services that are provided to a member whose condition requires ongoing monitoring, assessment, nursing interventions on a consist consistent or constant basis. Sorry. And then you can see down at the bottom, uh, the different sections or different areas of where this word is used, or these words, I guess, because it's two. It's in the eligibility section and the prior authorization procedures. I knew this was a good place to start. So, John, I'm going to turn it over to you to facilitate all of the hands that are up. All righty. Thank you, Candace. And, folks, I don't think I mentioned this at the beginning, but you'll see the hands being raised, and there's a little icon on the bottom of your screen with a hand. That's where you can click to raise your hand. There are also some people who are phone only, it appears, and I will be asking at times, giving them an equal shot at speaking. I'll ask them to unmute, give me their name if they want to join the speaker's queue. I'll do that in a minute. So let's start with Galia. And um, I am asking folks if you can to keep it to two minutes. I'll give a little reminder at one minute 45 and we'll see how that goes. I know these are complicated issues. I've learned that from these meetings, so we need to be flexible. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. You have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to alert HICPEF that this definition of continuous nursing is in full violation of the Board of Nursing and the Colorado State Nurse Practice Act and the Nurse Aid Practice Act, number 12-255-104. Again, it is in full violation by definition according to the State Nurse Practice Act, which states, the practice of professional nursing means the delivery of independent and collaborative nursing care to individuals of all ages, families, groups, and communities, whether sick or well in all settings. The function includes initiation and performance of nursing care through health promotion, supportive or restorative care, disease pre prevention, diagnosis and treatment of human disease, ailment, pain, injury, deformity, and physical or mental condition using specialized knowledge, judgment, and skill involving the application of biological, physical, social, and behavioral science principles required for la licensure as a professional nurse pursuant to section 12-255-110. The practice of professional nursing includes the performance of such services as evaluating health status through the collection and assessment of health data, health teaching and health counseling, 
provides therapy and treatment that is supportive and restorative to life and well-being, either directly to the patient or indirectly through consultation with delegation to, supervision of, teaching of others, executing delegated medical functions and delegated patient care function, referring to medical or community agencies, those patients who need further evaluation or treatment, and finally, the reviewing and monitoring therapy and treatment plan. Again, this is in violation of the Colorado Start Nurse Start uh, the Colorado State Nurse Practice Act, and this needs to be removed immediately. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Galia. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, raise that. I will say we are actually defining a specific type of nursing benefit that is covered within the state of Colorado. And that is something that we are required to do from the federal government. And so um, we will have lots of attorney generals in that office looking at this to make sure we are not violating any statutes. You are, that's what I'm trying to tell okay. you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Gaia. So we'll move to Katie. Katie, can you, thanks very much. you have two minutes. We can, thank you. Great. Um, I just wanna say, I, I don't think, uh, there should not be a definition of continuous nursing in this regulation because PDN does not require continuous nursing. Based on the federal regulation, as well as our state statute, what PDN requires is more continuous nursing than can be provided in our case through the home health benefit. And so if more than intermittent nursing or more than what's provided in the home health benefit is required, then that means it's continuous and that means it's under the PDN. Um, I think this definition, whether this is the intent or not, really severely limits what would be considered PDN because it's asking for things like a continual basis or a constant basis. That's just not what the, Fed the federal regulations required. It is not what our state statute requires. And I think the result of having this in here would be to really limit and there would be a bunch of people who would need more than what's provided in the home health benefit who would not be captured under this definition and they are going to be stuck. This definition should be fully scrapped. Thanks. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you, Katie. This is John again. I will move to the uh, phone folks to see. I'm going to try to alternate here in a way that uh, seems to make sense. Is there anyone who's on the phone only? You can press star six to unmute your phone and give me your name if you want to enter into the speaker's queue. Anyone there? Phone? Who's that? Hi, John Barry. This is Erica Drury with MTA Home Care. Okay, Erica, I'll be right with you. Okay, we'll get to you. Let's finish with Megan and then Erica, we will come to you. Thank you. Megan, thank you very much. Hi. Go ahead, two minutes. This is Megan Bowser with Family Voices Colorado. Um, assuming that the definition stays in uh, and Katie and Galia's comments are not followed. Um, my big problem with this is the word and in a couple places that it says it's requiring ongoing assessment, planning, and intervention. I think it should be or, both in that first sentence and in the last one, assessment or nursing interventions. They may not be constantly assessing if they're doing an intervention or they may need constant assessment, but not constant intervention and both should be included versus how is it as it's worded now, it sounds like all three of those things have to be happening all the time, which is not life in reality. That's super helpful feedback. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you, Megan. So, uh, Aaron, you're up on the phone. Thank you very much. Two minutes if you can. Hi, this is Erica Drury with MGA Home Care, and I just wanted to echo the comments of the previous speakers and also um, just focus on the on a regular basis and the word constant. Um, I think that those are just dangerous um, to include. And I think maybe a more appropriate word would be ongoing. Um, it's, it's just very concerning. And by this gauge, uh, you're, quanti you're quantifying the intervention or care on a constant basis as ICU or hospital, like an ICU or a hospital setting. And that's really an impossible benchmark we feel. Um, even in a highly acute setting, one nurse is assessing and inter intervening on multiple patients, uh, meaning there will be, you know, periods that patients don't receive constant assessment and intervention, as the previous speaker said, and while the other patient needs are met, like in the hospital or the ICU setting. So, um, 
Just also wanted to say that a lot of participants for this meeting are having trouble accessing the meeting via Google Meet and are only able to join via phone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, first, thank you for that uh, very helpful feedback and that suggestion of changing the constant to ongoing basis. That's very helpful. Um, and I have folks looking in to see if we can figure out what's going on with the meeting. I'm not sure. Um, we're certainly not at capacity. So uh, I'm hopeful that we can figure out how to get everybody in. Um, but all the more reason to make sure that we are recording things. Uh, so hopefully people can get that worked out. Um, Cassie, do you have, and sorry, I want to pause just for a second. Have we had a chance? Do we know what's going on with the meeting? I don't. I was going to just send the direct link. I'm not sure why some have been able to access and others are not. Okay. All right. We are still working on that. Thank you for escalating that. Thank Candace, you so I'm much. So sorry. Candace, this, is Chris. <laughs> this is Chris. I just wanted to tell you that on the web page for PDN, mm -hmm. where there's a, this meeting is mentioned, it has a different login. So that may be what your problem is. I tried mm -hmm. to get in there initially and couldn't. And then tried this one successfully. Okay, thank you very much for that. The one we couldn't access that's what's on the media meeting agenda. So are you seeing a different one on the page? On the PDN site, there's just, there. this meeting is mentioned and there's a, a an agenda with a login that doesn't work. Correct. Okay, I'll look for an alternative one on the page, thanks. Well, thank you, Chris. This is John Barry. Apologies for whatever has happened. I'm going to throw a link into the chat. Oh, it's not going to help people who can't get in, but we have an. We could share it with folks, John. So I think that'd be helpful. Okay, we have an online calendar, uh, and the PDN meeting is posted there, and um, I will pop that into the chat. The URL, the link for that page, and um, that may be somewhat helpful. I can read it out, Candace, if you want me to read out the link for folks. No, I don't think so. Okay. I think if folks are going to share it, they can just grab it from the chat. Thank you so much, John. Okay. Right. Um, so we've received some helpful feedback um, thus far on this proposed, again, I will continue to use the word proposed definition um, and some suggested changes and deletions. Uh, other thoughts, comments, or feedback on this particular definition here? All right, let's move to the next one. Looks like we have more folks joining, so hopefully that worked. Okay, so uh, a new proposed definition is designated representative. Uh, so this, again, I don't necessarily need to read it to you all. Um, you can find this in the provider requirements and utilization review for the use of this term. Not seeing 40 hands shoot up right at once. Perhaps we should move to the next one. And then if folks want me to go back, we always could. All right. Um, the a proposed revision for family or in-home caregiver, uh, changing obviously client to member because we were doing that throughout. Um, and then updating when instead of saying uh, when home health agency staff is not present, just changing that to absent. And then again, just changing the only other change there would be to and I see we have lots of folks joining us um, and one hand raised, John. Great, so folks, again, if you want to join the speaker's queue at this point, you can raise your hand in the webinar. I will call again to see if there's anyone on the phone only who would like to join. Galia, please go ahead. Thank you, two minutes if you can. Thank you very much. Hi, can you hear me or should I change speaker? Sorry, I'm in the car, so. We, we can hear you. You can? Yeah. Okay, great. I have a lot of um, concerns about the identification and determination by the state of Colorado um, for identifying family and living caretaker under this definition. First of all, it is against federal guidelines for what a live-in caretaker or family care provider is. 
Um, that is identified in IRS Code 2014-7, and there are also other federal laws um, that apply to this. Specifically in reference to the wording of this, I tr truly question why the department is starting to do this process under a PDN rule stating that family or caregiver, in-home caregiver, can only be identified as number one, unpaid, and then the wording at the end says either living in the residence home or living out of the residence home. I have huge concerns because this is against federal guidelines, federal statutes, and current laws. Um, HICPUF has also identified what family and uh, live-in uh, caregivers really are. Um, and the biggest concern is that, you know, there, there's a lot of repercussions to this, including access and denial to additional services that families are able to tap into. One of them is uh, to be able to tap into the Colorado legal services due to their income as a parent or a family caretaker. Um, the other is other services such as LEAP and everything else that is income-based. And currently under the HICPUF memo, it specifically outlines what a family or caretaker or live-in is. I truly question if this is the first step in a process of HICPUF actually attacking parent caretakers and trying to take that out of statute completely. Um, and if this is the first step to kind of towards that. Currently, there's such a shortage of providers, period. I haven't had a nurse in over three years post-pandemic. There's a huge shortage of respite providers, huge, there's no support services. Parents are the only ones that are providing this. And to attack yeah, parents yeah. in this way yeah, is yeah. unacceptable. It's yeah, yeah, unacceptable. Galia, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, you're at two minutes and we'd like to um, remind you of that fact. And I understand what you're saying, super important. And uh, we do try to ask people to do within two minutes to make their point. Thank you, John. Um, and, and I appreciate that. And Galia, this is actually a definition that currently exists and we're proposing changes to it. So if you have other suggested changes to this definition that is already here, um, we are certainly open to those. It sounded like perhaps the unpaid, uh, uh, the unpaid piece is what's concerning to you. Um, but uh, there is no, I mean, this is just us making changes mostly to the word from client to member here. So if there are other suggested changes, we're certainly open to them. Um, John, back to you. So Thanks, is there anyone up? else who uh, wants to make a comment or question at this point, you can raise your hand in the webinar to enter into the queue. If there's anyone else on the phone who has a comment, you can unmute and Give me your name. Okay, Christy Blakely, please go ahead. Thanks, two minutes if possible. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> I am concerned about the unpaid individual because that is looking like um, we're saying families should not be paid to do, uh, especially children's care, adult care, whatever. Um, so I would, I would like to, uh, put in a complaint that that's not where we want to go. Um, families are paid to be uh, CNAs or whatever. And um, if this is to uh, ebb the tide that's going to happen with uh, community first choice and uh, in-home support services and uh, CDASS growth, I understand. But um, folks should be paid to do what they're doing above and beyond a normal parent role. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Um, this has nothing to do with any other uh, benefits that are in existence or any changes that are happening with CFC. Um, this is, again, all of the language here, except for what is underlined or uh, has a strike through, is uh, currently in existence. And so we can certainly take a look at the unpaid piece, which seems to be causing the most concern. So that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So, Megan, you're up next. You have two minutes. Thank you very much. Megan Bowser. Thanks. Um, my question around this is where is this definition being utilized? So, 
you know, we can define this here, but I'm more concerned about where that's being used within the regulations in terms of how concerning it is that it says unpaid. But I agree with what everyone has said so far that I don't think we need to define whether it's unpaid or paid because family caregivers do both and we don't want to be putting that at risk. <laughs> but I would be interested in what context this is being utilized to know how concerning it is. Yeah, so that's helpful. If you can see at the bottom here is the citations for where this definition uh, it like lives within the regulations. Um, so you can see it listed down at the bottom there within these regulations. Um, but, uh, you know, agree. I hear you all loud and clear about the removal of the unpaid. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Okay, next is Amy. Amy, thank you. You have two minutes. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I also have concerns about the unpaid portion of the statute, whether it is ongoing or something that you're going to implement, because I know in other states that has been an issue, and the state has turned around and used that to not provide PDN services for clients when they're not available. And as we all know, that's a big issue right now. Um, PDM is not available for many of the families. And I think that needs to look, be looked at more closely. And I agree with everyone else. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback, Amy. Thanks, Amy. Next up is Edward. Edward, you have two minutes. Thank you. Hi, sexually, I really have a so I used to have to use my husband's uh, accounts to log in. That's it. Um, so I think just to sum up the overarching concern is that because within the PDN field, uh, there's so many family members who are registered nurses, who are licensed, um, you know, CNAs, and they are getting paid as part of this program. So maybe instead of uh, focusing, you know, we can focus on paid part, but maybe have an addendum to this definition where we can uh, describe when would be the situations when the family members would be paid caregiver when, you know, as somebody said, there's a definition already out there when they go above and beyond what expected of the family, maybe reiterating it here so it comes together and there's no like a talk to everybody to see, oh, it's unpaid, but I am a registered nurse who is providing services for my family member, for example, and uh, as such getting paid. So just bringing those two together just to clear for clarification and clarity. Thank you. That's very helpful. That looks like Megan raised her hand yeah. again. Thank you, Megan. So I'm, I need to go and look at the context more particularly, but I'm guessing that based on the need for this definition, that what we're really talking about is care that is provided when a paid caregiver is not available. And so I wonder if we need to keep a definition similar to this in there, if it needs to not say family in home caregiver, it just needs to define an unpaid caregiver as a separate thing and not mention that that could be a family member or anybody else, but just saying that sometimes PDN is not available and an unpaid caregiver will come into the, the home or will, will provide that care at some point to make sure they are staying in the community, but separate family and unpaid so there's not some assumption that every family member is an unpaid caregiver. Thank you, Megan. All right, let's move on uh, to the next slide here. Uh, that is all really excellent feedback, so I really appreciate everybody um, jumping in to provide that. Um, our next definition here is around group nursing. It's uh, really just the provision of private duty nursing for more than one member in a private home setting. It's pretty simple, straightforward. Um, and uh, you can see the areas where we have those listed are benefit limitations. I wanna go through a couple of definitions because we have a lot to get through today and we don't have um, a lot of time. So I'm gonna go to the next slide and we can take, we'll do a couple of slides and then we can start taking comments again. Um, home health agency, again, this is an existing definition. This is already in the regulations and we are updating this one to mention that it's a public agency or an organization and then getting rid of some of the outdated terms and then adding the fact that they are actually, these agencies are required to 
have a either class A or are required to have a class A license through the Colorado Public uh, Department of Public Health and Environment in order to operate that. So just making sure that that is perfectly clear within these regulations. And let's do one more and then we can go back and take all uh, the comments. I, I hear you guys and I promise we will get there. Uh, medical necessity. So this is one that we've talked about several times around what does medical necessity mean here? How are you guys defining it? And so here is a definition for it. Um, I fully anticipate we will have a lot of uh, robust conversation around this one as well, but I wanted to give us a starting point. Um, and again, uh, the medical necessity can be found within eligibility and the prior authorization procedures sections. And with that, John, I will turn it back over to you and we can take some comments. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'll jump into the queue here, folks, just a reminder, we will uh, try to keep things to two minutes to make your point. Thanks everyone for that. Gallia, please go ahead. Um, are there other hands that are up just because I'm driving and I'm late? I'm gonna be pulling up in a minute. Yes, there are, Gallia. I will okay, go ahead and take the next one. Line. Okay, Katie, you have two minutes. Thank you so much. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, I wanted to do the home health agency one, and then I can do medical necessity once we move on. Um, and my my main comment was just why are we defining it again? It's already in what is it? Eight. Ooh, hang on, sorry. It's already in the home health um, definition. I just lost my notes. I'm sorry. Eight five two point one J already defines it. Um, and then in the section that in our draft section from 8540.6 um, for provider agency requirements. A lot of this is already listed. So um, in the draft that we already reviewed, it says that the home health agency must be licensed by the state and have a class A and it has all that information is already in there um, in the other draft piece. So I just think there's a lot of um, repetition that's unnecessary. And again, I'm not sure why we can't just refer to the home health agency definition that we already have earlier in the regulation. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those, we can talk about whether or not we need to define it, um, but since this is the definition section, which comes first, we typically have that. Um, and then we use, we have a definition section for each of our uh, benefits. And so we don't typically just rely on other definitions within other eight um, areas because we wanna make sure that it's clear for each benefit. So but we can certainly talk about whether or not we need to define home health agency because to your point, we do list out the requirements around the class A providers and later on, that is helpful. Other thoughts on that? Hearing none for now, Candace. Okay. Shall we move forward? Gaudia, if you're there. Oh, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm and yeah, you, you I have two minutes, please. Thank you. Great. I just want to um, see if we can clarify the, the first slide um, when it comes to identifying providing nursing, nursing services in a home care setting, um, mostly because, uh, again, a lot of our kids may not be getting it in the home. And I really worry that uh, making that so specific will then exclude PDN services that are being provided in schools or in any other environment. Um, I would like to echo um, that the home health agency identification um, means a provider of home health services and is defined in section 255-4-101. Um, and it specifically is certified by the Department of Public Health um, and Environment. So I, I generally question why that's um, in the role as well. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Galia. I understand your meaning when you're talking about the group nursing definition about having a home setting. We don't want to necessarily exclude community-based services. Um, and so we can certainly take a look at that and then um yeah i appreciate the feedback on the home health uh definition as well thank you Galia. so next up 
uh, ma'am, I didn't catch your name, but on the screen it says Edward. Laura Boy, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, John. Yes, um, if you don't mind, uh, put back the definition of the group, um, nursing group, great, I mean, uh, group nursing, I'm sorry. Um, I think it might be missing because if we, for previous discussion, when we talked about the definition of um, RN group rate or LPN group, it said specifically at the same time in the same setting. And I think that same setting is missing from that definition. This says in a private home setting. So maybe originating from the same side or in the same setting, just to make sure that's again, more clarity for that. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie, you're up next. You have two minutes, thank you. Thanks. Um, I was just going to switch over to medical necessity. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that um, my understanding is that for kids, so for children 20 and younger, um, for medical necessity, it's it's both the general definition that's in the program integrity rules 8076.18, which is which is re referred to here, but with the addition of the added flexibility of the EPSDT. So it's not just the EPSDT, but that it includes both. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was included in here. Thank you for that clarification. And we will clarify that and make sure that um, we have that worded properly. Thanks, everybody. Candace, it's all we have for right now. Great. Well, let's keep going. All right. Um, OK, so the new definition, another new proposed term is medically stable. Um, and it's short and sweet. It's a member's skilled care medical needs are routine and not subject to frequent change because of health issues. This is uh, in the following section of the 8.540.6.F. And Christy, I see you. We're going to go through a couple of these because I'm very worried I'm not going to get through them all. Um, so let's go through the next one really quick too. Nursing assessment. So this is one we spent quite a bit of time on uh, last month or the month before. I have no idea when it was. Um, uh, so we wanted to define what we meant by nursing assessment. Um, and so you can read that um, there. And those are the sections that's within eligibility and prior authorization procedures. This was um, really discussed a lot with our clinical team. And so I, I see that we've got lots of feedback on this one as well. Uh, before we jump in, let's do one more definition. And I promise we can come back. And then uh, physician or loud practitioners. Again, here is uh, another definition, um, and it is cited throughout the entirety of the rule. And so we thought it was uh, helpful and important to make sure that we are defining it. All right. Christy, I believe, wanted to discuss the medically stable. So let's go back to that definition. And John, I will allow you to take over. All right, thank you. So, Christy, you're up first. You have two minutes. Thank you. Medically stable. Um, I was just going to say that I, I feel like in the medically stable, that's not the same definition you had up a few minutes ago. Frequent change because of health issues. Uh, I think one of the things that confuses me is we're not using decision making, which is part of uh, that the nurse skilled level. Um, and so in medically stable, I think we need to talk about uh, clarifying these, this language a little bit more, that the, um, that the medical needs, um, not routine or subject to frequent change, but there's a decision-making requirement uh, to knowing what to do using your nurse degree. I see. Okay. So adding that piece in there around decision-making. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank that you. Is helpful. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. I am going to, as we go into deeper into meetings at times, I will call first on people we haven't heard from. I believe Eliza, we haven't heard from you yet, and then I'll go through the uh, hands in order. Please go ahead, Eliza. You have two minutes. Eliza Schultz. Okay, I'll come back. Yeah, you please go ahead. You have two minutes. Thank you. I wanted to raise concern about the medically stable definition. 
um, because it seems that we're using <laughs> Google to identify that as a legal definition, and it provides the state of Colorado the power to just identify a patient as medically stable based purely on the basis of the criteria of this definition. And that is something that is only done by a physician. Even the Colorado DMV has a five-page physician certification. This is identification of a medical condition that requires physician certification for the state of Colorado to define that and to apply that to patients is against the law. Second of all, uh, nursing assessment specifically is in full violation of the State Nurse Practice Act. 12-255-104, again, the practice of professional nursing, as well as <clears throat> treating means the selection, recommendation, execution, and monitoring of those nursing measures essential to the effective determination and management of actual potential care functions and human health problems to the execution of delegated medical functions and delegated patient care functions. The delegated medical functions and delegated patient care functions shall be performed under the responsibility, direction, and supervision of a licensed health care provider. And that is not being done. It is stating that a home health agency staff member or anybody can perform a nursing assessment, which is against the Board of Nursing, against the Colorado State Nurse Practice Act, should be totally taken out of this rulemaking because, again, this is again, against the Board of Nursing and our Colorado State Nurse Practice Act. Thank you so much. Thank you, Galia. We, I will go back to Eliza Schultz, see if you're with us. Thanks for raising your hand. Eliza, can are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I also have a couple concerns about um, the nursing assessment definition, as well as the uh, medically stable definition. Um, both are are vague, and um, I worry that they'll be um, difficult, at least for the previous definition, difficult to determine. Um, you know, home health agencies have a requirement to do uh, regular assessments on their um, clients, and um, there could be changes that are quote unquote frequent because of those required assessments, but that doesn't mean that the, the person is not stable. Um, so I think this definition needs um, some more work. And then, um, John, could you, or whoever's doing the slides, go to the nursing assessment? Um, <clears throat> I also agree that this is concerning because it says that a nursing assessment is done by a home health, health agency staff person. Um, a nursing assessment should be done by a nurse. Um, and I also worry about this desired outcomes language in there. Not all of the clients under PDN are going to have rehabilitative or discharge plan plans. This could be just um, supports to have them have activities of daily living and that they may not quote unquote graduate from the PDN program. So this makes me think that like the purpose of the nursing assessment is to improve conditions in such a way that the person no longer needs PDN. And I'm not sure that that accurately reflects the mission of the program. Thanks, Eliza, that's helpful. That is um, not the intent of that phrase there. Um, and so uh, I appreciate you pointing it out uh, to us that that is kind of how it reads. So we can take that back and take a look at that um, along with uh, the agency staff as well. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. And Megan, you are up next. Thank you. You have two minutes. Yeah, um, going back to the medically stable definition, I agree with what's been said that it is um, very, very vague and needs to have some criteria on who can make that determination and more specific about what that means because it is such an essential part to receiving services. And right with this, it seems like anybody could declare somebody medically stable or not medically stable because the definition is so vague. Thank you, Megan. 
Thank you, Megan. Looks like we have one more. Erica, please go ahead. You have two minutes. Thanks. If you are using your computer audio, there's an icon to unmute or star six. If you have oh, a thank you. Sorry. I was muted, of course. I have two comments. The first, um, will be brief. It's just a suggestion for the nursing assessment definition where it says home health staff. Um, we feel that it should say home health nurse for obvious reasons. The nurses are doing the assessment and of course they're staff of the home health agency, but we do have other staff with the home health agency as well that don't include nurses. So if we could clarify that, we would appreciate it. My other comments are around medically stable. And our main concern here is the majority of our patients live their lives at home in a stable condition. Of course, ICU and ED level intervention by definition cannot occur in a home environment. Otherwise, these patients would need to be hospitalized due to necessary equipment and the physician level of intervention care needed if care needed that is elevated at that level. Um, the nursing interventions um, lead to sustained stability and reduced hospitalization and illness in the home environment, as others have kind of reiterated. Um, it seems uh, counterintuitive to claim that the stability in the presence of long-term medical need mitigates the need for further intervention. And so we just feel that this definition could use some additional work, as others have said. So those are our comments, and thank you so much. Thank you, Erica. Uh, Candace, that's all we have for now. Great. Thank you so much. And it seems like um, I'm wondering if we need to define medically stable because it's only mentioned in one area around um, the you know physician and lab practitioner role where it's the home health agency is required to coordinate with the member's attending physician to determine if the, the member is medically stable. Um, and able to be served under the limitations of the PDN benefit. So maybe this is one where in our attempt to provide clarity for these regulations, it actually, you know, made it a little bit muddier. <laughs> it looks like Claire raised her hand. Claire, please go ahead. Thank you. Two minutes. Uh, yeah, I thought that medically stable used to be part of the eligibility criteria for the PDN program, so you had to be medically stable. I just double check that before, um, if that's still in the regs. I uh, will have to take that back to the team and see if that was one of the changes or if it's still there um, or not. I don't have those directly in front of me, but I think that's an important point of distinction. Anyone else for the queue? You can raise your hand in the webinar down below to get into the queue. Looks like we have one person who's on the phone only. If you want to speak, you can unmute star six. Give me your name. Candice, I think that's all for the moment. All right, let's move forward. Okay, this next one, again, this is an existing definition that uh, is already in the regulations, and we are just proposing some very, very minor changes, um, again, changing client to member, um, you know, things that have been ordered by the physician or the allowed practitioner, um, and just adding those phrases in there. So super, super minor changes is already exists within the regulations today. Go to the next one, please. And then uh, private duty nursing, another definition that obviously currently exists. Um, we are required, we have to define our benefits. We have to define those within our regulations. And so this is the benefit. And so um, coming up with a definition that is a little bit more clear of what PDN means, um, individualized skilled care that requires the application of adding that term there to help make it much more clear. Um, and then adding in, you know, in the home setting by registered nurse or licensed practical nurse with that additional information as well. Again, PDN is cited throughout the whole rule. This is the entire, this is what we are talking about. And so this is really hard to, or uh, important to define. And again, changes here, not coming up with a brand new definition. Next one, please. 
The next definition where we haven't proposed any changes because I think it's pretty straightforward, but rehospitalization um, and where that is cited there. So, and then let's do uh, one more because I want to make sure we get through these skilled nursing tasks. This is a new definition that we're proposing and it can be found within the eligibility and reimbursement sections of the regulations. All right, lots of hands, lots of uh, conversation. I imagine we are gonna go all the way back, um, but John, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Candace. And folks, we have some hands in the queue. Feel free while someone is speaking, if you wanna jump in, it'll help me budget the time. Galia, you are up first. You have two minutes, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I just had some concerns again uh, in reference to the wording and on the plan of care and the nursing part, it specifically states a home setting and at his or her residence. And again, a lot of our uh, patients and our kids receive services in multiple environments. So I think not making it so specific and especially like school and things like that. Um, and then I would like to also cite the Board of Nursing um, our Colorado State Nurse Practice Act 12-255-104 in reference to the plan of care. The delegation of patient care includes aspects of patient care that may be delegated by a licensed healthcare provider within the scope of the provider's practice and within the provi provider's professional judgment to a licensed or an unlicensed healthcare provider within the scope of that provider's practice. When we look at plan of patient care, um, it, you know, there are specific things within the State Nurse Practice Act that talks about delegation of nursing tasks again. And that also talks about the stability of the condition of the patient, the training, no delegation shall be made without the delegating nurse making a determination that in his or her professional judgment, the delegated task can be properly and safely performed by the delegatee and the delegation is commensurate with the patient's safety and welfare. And the delegation, uh, the delegating nurse shall be solely responsible for determining the required degree of supervision the delegatee will need after an evaluation of the appropriate factors, which shall include but not be limited to the following. And then it lists the nature of the nursing task being delegated, whether that delegated task has a predictable outcome, the training, the stability of the condition of the patient. I just fear yeah, that, that, um, that we're very limited I, just purely by the location. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. you. Seconds, please. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Galia. Um, I appreciate that. I think the location is a key area that we need to take a look and um, revise that because we do have a lot of members that go out into the community. So thank you very much. Katie, you are up next. You have two minutes. Thank you. Um, thanks. So focusing on the plan of care definition, um, I just wanted to point out sort of similarly to the home health agency definition that um, it's definitely something that's referred to and defined elsewhere in the regulations. Um, and so two specific points. One is just that throughout the draft that we've been given over the past year or so, um, plan of care is referenced a lot and it will be referenced and then it'll say um, a specific document that is needed as part of the plan of care and it doesn't seem to be consistent throughout. So um, I would certainly suggest like when you all are going back, going through the full draft to like check every part that is mentioned the plan that mentions the plan of care because um, I found that they're not consistent and so it can be kind of confusing. Um, and I also wanted to say, and this is probably user error on my fault, I couldn't find 42 CFR 484.18 um, that's referenced here. My guess is it's that's my mistake, not yours. Um, but I did want to point out and sort of make sure that um, in 42 CFR 484.50, that that's a patient's right section and it makes clear that um, patients have the right when they're establishing and revising the plan of care that they have the right to participate in, be informed about and consent or refuse care in advance of an enduring treatment where appropriate with respect to the plan of care. Um, and so I was just going to suggest that in that right here what we have is just written in consultation with the member, but in fact that there are a lot more rights um, provided within the Fed uh, from the federal regulations. Um, that should also be included. And I'm partly saying that because, you know, we've had clients come to us saying, you know, where their home health agency has requested fewer hours than the plan of care indicate that they actually find medically necessary. Um, and so then the family has to go back and say, wait a minute, I want more hours. I need, I need you home health agency to request more hours. So I wanna make sure that those rights um, that the patients themselves have um, are, are written out here. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. 
Pam, you are up next. You have two minutes. Thank you. I guess my question is on your definition of skilled nursing. Um, you, you mentioned finding it in your um, fee schedule. So are you using that to, because everything that a nurse does in an intervention is a skilled nursing task. So is that, is that what you're, you're getting at, or are you getting at the different speech? Because you're forever calling it intermittent. So now are you calling it skilled? Like, what is this referencing as far as, is this referencing specific things within the PDN or is, is it referencing what isn't PDN? Yeah, so thank you, Pam. Um, so what I mentioned was not in the fee schedule was actually in the different sections within the PDN regulations now um, in the draft. So you can find a reference to skilled nursing tasks in the eligibility section and a reference um, where we use the term skilled nursing tasks in the reimbursement section. So there's so that's therefore why we came back to define the term in its entirety is because that term is referenced with throughout the regulations. So what you're using it for here is to define what a skilled nursing task is within the context of PDN. Correct. Okay. Okay, thank you. Katie, you are up next. Or was that? I think Claire is next. Claire is next and I'll go after Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, so I'm I'm concerned about whether or not this addition of a definition of nursing assessment is adding more work to be done in order for a person to get found eligible for PDN services or the amount of services. I thought that the um, plan of care was essentially the assessment that helped establish the need for skilled nursing services and helped um, establish the um, number of hours when used in conjunction with the PDN acuity tool. Uh, so I guess my question is, is this another series of papers that need to be filled out and how are they different from the plan of care? Perhaps the department could um, in the regulations refer to the actual document or link to the document that they're um, referring to so that people could see what it is that they're using. Also had a um, concern, uh, well, many about the definition of private duty nursing, but just wanted to um, point out that I don't think you should remove the distinction between um, um, the, the type of care that PDN serves and provides um, against the home health benefit because that really is what makes the PDN service uh, the service that it is. It isn't the task-oriented home health nurse service that is, um, you know, an hour or two hours in scope. And you've taken that out, the, comp the comparison, you've taken it out of the definition of private duty nursing. Thanks. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I believe we have a response coming. Yeah, I was going to see if perhaps our clinical team would be able to hop on to discuss the nursing assessment um, or not. I don't know if they... Candice, I'm on here. This is Valerie. Right, Valerie, thank you so much. You're um, very welcome. So this particular nursing assessment definition belongs with the plan of care or the 485. And at the time that an agency identifies need or is recertificating, recertifying, excuse me, um, needs, this is just expanding on what, what that assessment should include. So it is an agency nurse who's going out and performing that assessment and identifying really what's been happening? What do they see as the kind of the future needs? This is really, I see it as kind of an umbre umbrella assessment that again, that is part of the plan of care. Um, it is on the 485 um, and it, just looking for some clarity on what that nursing assessment is and who it's performed by. It's, thank you for that, Valerie. Thank You're you. Welcome. Um, this is John. I know we do have Katie still in the queue and we accidentally lowered your hand prematurely. And then we'll get to Megan and, and others. Uh, Katie, go ahead, please. 
two minutes. Thank you. I was going to move on to the PDN definition, um, and I've said this before. I will say it again. Um, and I appreciate Candace you saying that this definition isn't very different than the old one, which is absolutely true. Um, but I think we're all here rewriting these rules because of these sort of ongoing crises that keep popping up. And I think a lot of it has to do with this continuous nursing. So what I've said before and will say again, um, PDN does not require continuous nursing. It doesn't. Um, our state statute makes clear that it requires anything that is more individualized and continuous than the nursing care available under the home health benefit. And the federal definition says that it is more individual and continuous than is available from a visiting nurse. It does not require continuous nursing care. And I don't think that should be in the definition. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. We will move to Megan. Megan, please go ahead. You have two minutes. Thank you. Yes, um, also on the private duty nursing definition, I agree with Katie that that continuous word is a huge problem there. And again, the word and, so it should be that list of items intervening and, or evaluation, not and evaluation. And then again, we have the home setting issue in this one as well. Thank you very much, Megan. We will move now back to Galia. Galia, you have two minutes. Thank you. Hi, thank you again. I would like to also raise concerns in reference to the private duty nursing definition um, in context to intermittent and continuous nursing, because there's no such thing. Um, and it is against a federal statute, and it would really, really um, inhibit a physician um, according to the federal EPSDT law and really ordering what's medically necessary. Um, again, the PDN, sorry, I just ran up the stairs. The PDN um, context that's being used is really, really questionable. And, and, and I really, really worry about the nursing assessment piece because it's saying that it's done by any home health agency staff. And if uh, it can, this can be totally taken into out of context and used into practice of delegation of nursing assessment and the wording should be totally scrapped. Um, if you wanted to put nursing assessment in reference to eligibility or criteria or plan of care, then again, you put it into the context of plan of care the nursing assessment will be performed by a registered nurse or an allowed provider or a physician um, for, for it to be used in that context. And I really, really worry that now we're looking at delegating you know, uh, a nursing assessment, which is not appropriate in all of our um, families and, and, and members and clients. Um, so I, I echo, a lot of my concerns as the previous ones in reference to um, identifying location yeah, and residence yeah, yeah. and having the ability to have it be so specific, whereas we have a lot of community settings where our children receive PDN so that they can access their community. And that is the whole point of PDN. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Claire, you are up next. You have two minutes. Thank you. Um, again, going back to this, this really changes, this change in the definition of private duty nursing is significant um, and not the way it, sh it should be. Um, you're, the whole point of the original definition was to say that the private duty nursing service was somehow different than the nursing service that was provided under the home health benefit. It didn't talk about a home setting. It was compared to the home health benefit or nursing services provided in a hospital or nursing facility. I don't think that that comparison should be taken out. I actually think the language, at least with respect to the hospital or nursing facility, is in the federal regulation. You shouldn't, there's no point in removing that. It's required under the federal regulation. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. Pam, you are next, please. You have two minutes. Thank you. I just, um, under private duty nursing, you have added um, towards the bottom, the statement that says, um, who is employed by or contracted with a licensed home health agency? I'm just curious if you could give me an example of where it would be appropriate to have a contracted or 1099 nurse 
um, participating in, in PDN services? We don't dictate how um, the employer contractor um, relationship works. So by adding that, it just makes it clear. Okay. Thank you very much. Eliza. And I just want to, and real quick before Eliza goes, there's a lot of conversation happening around whether or not we're trying to restrict things in other settings. And uh, as I have stated in each of the times that has been pointed out, we appreciate you pointing out that the home setting, which most of these were actually old uh, wording, is needs to be updated. And so we are going to update that. So just to be clear, we are not trying to eliminate or restrict any sort of community-based setting for individuals. These, this is the reason why we come here is so that we can make sure that we get proper feedback. And so that is noted. I appreciate you guys bringing that up and we will make those changes. Thank you, Candace. Uh, Eliza, you're up next. You have two minutes. Thank you. Thanks, John, and thanks, Hickpuff, um, Candace, and Valerie, and team. I know this has been a heavy lift for you guys, and these rules have not been updated in quite some time. So I just want to throw that out there as a thank you for these meetings. Um, I will say for the Home Care and Hospice Association of Colorado, I am getting significant concern from agencies and the families we serve around this intermittent versus continuous nursing um, and really worried about the impacts um, of many families who, depending on how this is applied um, and implemented, many families could potentially lose this critical service that allows their parents to go to work, that um, allows you know some sort of normalcy for the other kiddos in the home. And um, we just would encourage you and agree with the comments that have been said before to not remove the um, comparison to the other facility types and those types of care, and also to um, remove the definition of continuous. Um, because from my layman's seat here as a lay person, not a clinician, if a person does not get approved for 24 hour care, then it is not potentially fits in the definition of continuous. Um, and so that is just a con concern that, that I've heard um, from my, my folks. Thanks. That's helpful. Thank you, Eliza. I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of the feedback on that. Um, we are going to move forward so that we can get through the last of these definitions here and go through our next steps and so that I can make sure that we have a chance to wrap up on time. So the next definition here, again, um, we just added in a couple of pieces. So this is the skilled nursing definition already exists in regulation. And so we wanted to update it by adding in the terms of or allowed practitioner where it makes sense. Um, and then, you know, for tasks that cannot be delegated. So this was important um, in, you know, adding those clarifying pieces for the next one for me, please. Um, and then technology dependent, with that it would, could simplify that a lot more and make it much more um, easy to follow. Again, this is uh, cited, you can see in the provider responsibility section of the regulations. So. Um, really updated this to make it a lot more uh, simplistic as far as the definition goes. Next slide, please. Utilization management. So since we have a, a utilization management process, it's important for us to define what a utilization management means. Um, and so we've added this definition in here for everybody. And we have one more, please. And then the utilization review contractor. So um, since we referenced those terms, we wanted to make sure that we define them within our regulations. And so there is the definition for the utilization review contractor. And so we have time for probably about 10 more minutes of discussion. And then I wanna make sure I have a chance to get into the next step so you all can know what's coming next after this meeting. But John, I will kick it back to you. Thank you, Candace. That would put it by my clock at 1127. I will call time. Uh, Chris Russell, good to hear from you. Please go ahead. You have two minutes. Hi, thank you, John. Um, I'm, 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 I don't know, for some reason, not comfortable with the uh, term allowed practitioner. I don't understand why that can't be 
defined. It's not like there's a bevy of allowed practitioners. Um, why is it that that hasn't been, I mean, if you're talking about a certified nurse assistant, it's only one thing that you could put under there perhaps where that could take delegation from a nurse. But I, I don't, I'm wondering what you're talking about with that term. So we did define that and I'm trying to figure out where it is. Um, so we did define physician or lab practitioners and then we utilized um, the definition from Medicare. Okay. So that is one of the definitions. Where, and, where is that specifically that that's defined specifically that term? Uh, a lot of practitioners. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It is actually slide twenty one. Okay. Here. My bad. Deck. No, you're good. Um, because that's why we defined it because we thought it would be helpful. <laughs> so and we can look that. I mean, it's just it's a physician assistant, nurse practitioner, clinical nurse specialist who oversees the delivery of skilled care for a member because not everybody always sees a physician. Sometimes um, the care is ordered by a nurse practitioner. And so we wanted to make sure that that was very clear. I thought that this was referring to in the context of the private duty nursing situation, not, I mean, not a physician or a physician assistant in a hospital or something. So it is specific within the private duty nursing benefit. However, a physician and physician assistant, you know, all that, we did utilize the Medicare definition because it makes sense there um, for how we get to the allowance of a trying to see where we have it. We have it in some of these definitions here where we added the, oh, so skilled nursing or skilled nursing service, you know, under the direction of a physician or allowed practitioner. So just making sure that's very clear. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. So next up is Katie. You have two minutes. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. I have two really quick ones um, specific to the utilization management. Um, the first piece is that I don't think it should say anything other than evaluates medical necessity um, because that's its job. Um, nothing can be medically necess necessary in the definition of medical necessity um, and not be appropriate. And similarly, the definition of medical necessity includes these efficiency concerns, right? Because it says shouldn't be more costly than other equally effective treatment options, is delivered in the most appropriate setting, et cetera. So those words are not necessary. Utilization management should only be looking at medical necessity. That's the first piece. And then the second piece is um, based on my reading of all the different pieces of the draft that we've been given over the past year, I'm not sure that the process um, that is described here is ever actually described in a step-by-step -step, um, way in this regulation. So I'm not sure it's clear what the home health agency does, what they provide to the utilization management vendor, the uh, excuse me, their URC, um, and then sort of how that goes back to the member. And I think that there may be a problem with the Administrative Procedures Act if that process isn't clearly articulated in the regulation, because it can be really hard for members to understand what are the steps by which they might be approved or denied. Um, and so I would definitely encourage HICPUF to go back and sort of make sure that when they're going through the full draft that these steps are actually articulated in the regulation um, so that everyone can understand what's going on. Thank you. That's super helpful. Thank you, Katie, I appreciate that. Thank you, Katie. Galia, you're up next. You have two minutes. Thank you. Not sure she's with us. Sorry, thank you. I, I also um, echo the concern of the URC just being focused on, um, on medical eligibility and medical necessity rather than other evaluations. And I worry that this context um, or the manner that it's worded could be um, questionable since then it would give the power of the URC to do a lot more than that. Um, and that needs to be defined a little bit better. Um, I also worry about the implications of what these definitions mean as a whole. Again, I question the intermittent and continuous nursing as being included in any of these definitions um, because that is not within the federal guidelines. It's not according to EPSDT. And I worry that it would limit the access to needed PDN services for children 
um, and therefore limit LTSS, um, which under <clears throat> the $1 billion that the state of Colorado is receiving ARPA funding on is not supposed to be limited while the funding is being received by the state of Colorado. And I am genuinely questioning how this process is going to increase rather than decrease access to these services. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Galia. Candace, that brings us to the end of the queue for now. Great. All right. So let's go into our next steps here. And then I see, I think Katie asked a process question. Um, so, um, okay, so the next steps, the future engagement opportunities. So we are going to be meeting again in October, I believe it's October 26th, um, from 10 to 11, says 11.20, we'll probably go to 11.30, um, to go through. And that, the goal for that meeting is to go back through the entirety of the regulations. So all of the draft, you can see all of the feedback that was taken and, you know, additional changes made and really walk through it. We're going to highlight some big picture items, some areas where we think we need a lot more discussion um, amongst the group um, and kind of hopefully from there be able to walk out of that with a good solid draft that we're ready to move forward with. We completely acknowledge the fact that that might be too big and too much for one meeting. And so we may need to host a second meeting um, for that to go through the entirety of the regulations because there's a lot there. Um, Katie, to answer your question, we post everything uh, a week ahead of time. Uh, these regulations and everything was posted, they were posted a week ahead of time for this meeting. Um, and that is our general rule of thumb to post them a week ahead of time. We do need time to get them put together and to work on them as well. Um, and so I hear you need more than a couple of days. And that is absolutely our goal to make sure that we get that out to you at least a full week um, ahead of time. So uh, for those of you that perhaps as you're still looking through these uh, regulations, and you want to, you can find them all on our private duty nursing webpage. Uh, you can continue to provide feedback to us. There is a Google form that I believe Cassie just put in the chat for you all. You can also utilize the home health inbox. So you can send an email, um, just put in the subject line, PDN rule comments. It just helps us sort it and filter it and make sure that we get that over to our listening log. You're also welcome to call uh, that number listed there and leave a message with your comments and your feedback. Um, we appreciate all feedback. Again, everything that is received from the meetings that we host and then also any emails or uh, anything that comes in via the Google form or voice message or anything like that is posted to our listening log, which is online. And let's see here. Next slide, please. Again, just different ways to provide uh, public feedback. The one that I'm, the two that I missed are, you could send us a fax if anybody still has a fax machine. Uh, you are welcome to still send us a fax or you can mail us a letter. Nobody gets snail mail anymore. So it'd be super fun to get a letter in the mail. Um, but feel free to utilize any of those methods that works best for you. We appreciate um, all feedback that we can receive. All right. And then next, go to the next one for me. I do believe we are almost out of time. Um, here is our home health inbox. If you have questions or you need to get a hold of us, uh, we do have multiple people that actually uh, receive these, including myself included, actually. It comes directly to my in uh, my email, as it does many other folks internally that receive these emails as they come in to make sure that uh, you receive a response as quickly as possible. And then our next slide is just a big thank you. Um, I appreciate you guys taking the time to thoughtfully take a look at the drafts that have been provided and provide us some feedback on anything from this whole thing should probably be scrapped to, hey, I think if you tweak this word here, it'll make a big difference or this change where you deleted this doesn't make sense. I think you need to add that back in as evidenced by uh, the comments around the comparison to the home health uh, benefit. It's really appreciated. Uh, your input is really important. It's always looked at. And I thank you all for taking your time to come and spend um, and coming and spending your time with us today. And I see a couple more um, comments in here. Christy, what we'll do is um, any comments that yeah, the answer is yes, we are going to be making changes based off of comments today. I couldn't list every single one of them off to you right now but they will all be listed in that listening log that will be online. Um, and with that, I think we can adjourn. Thank you so much for all of your time and your input.
and I look forward to seeing you on the 26th.